And we have come as far as chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Now, by the way, verse 30 begins with and. It, it, it links to John has brought us to Thomas because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Then the last beatitude in the Gospels, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed and many other signs truly did Jesus <clears throat> in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, notice there's purpose, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that purpose, believing you might have life through his name. So John gets around to the purpose <clears throat> of his writing, what he said in the gospel before he gives us the closing scene in history. And he's telling us here, look, I didn't write a biography. Uh, this, this is not a, a, you know, cultural history. I wrote for a confrontation. I wrote for a verdict. I wrote all of this by the Spirit to push for a decision. And it's something that he puts in the heart. He says that you might believe. So he said, this is confronting. All of the things that have been written, all the things Calvary Philly's been studying for the last year, he said, in all of that, there is a confrontation. And there's a contrast between 30 and 31 in the first two words in each verse. Verse 30 says, and many. And verse 31 says, but these, in contrast to the many. And he says there, that there are many other, notice, signs. Truly did Jesus, and he did them in the presence of his disciples, John being one, an old man thinking back to all of those things. And he says those are things that are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe in Jesus. Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. So he says, he says, many other signs did Jesus, but these are written for a reason. The, the, the idea is he doesn't use the normal word for miracles that the other gospel writers do. He, the things he outlines, some say seven signs, some say eight signs, depending whether you include the last chapter, uh, 21. Um, and five of those seven are exclusive to John. The walking on the water and the feeding the 5,000 we have in the other gospels as well. But John gives us five miracles we have nowhere else. And he says, but they're signs. In other words, they're revelatory. It's not just a miracle that happens. It's a, it's a miraculous event with a message attached to it. The blind man receives his sight, so Christ can talk about being the light of the world and what darkness the world is and how that he can give light and so forth. So the seven miraculous things that are brought before us, or eight, they're signs. They're not just miracles. John is saying they all have purpose. They all speak. They all have something to say. In all four Gospels combined, we have 36 miracles. 36 miracles in all four, four Gospels. And, and John says to us here, many other signs truly Jesus did. In fact, look in chapter 21, verse 25. It says, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which... If they should be written, everyone, I suppose, that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So John says the library that it would exist, if everything that Jesus had done had been written, the world itself couldn't contain the volumes. And then you look at his gospel, and there are seven signs, seven miracles. You think, well, <clears throat> why the brevity? 
You know, it, it, so why so few recorded in relation to a sum that we can hardly understand. And I believe that he says these things, and he says, are written. It's, it's the word of God. And it's so that our faith, you know, is founded on the word of God, that he de-emphasizes the miraculous. A lot of people in the church today, they want the sideshow. They want miraculous things. I'm thankful there are still miracles. We see them from time to time, but that's not the basis of what we believe. So you look at this vast, you know, number of things that Christ did. We don't have them all. We have 36 miracles from all four gospels and, and we have seven or eight here from John. And it de-emphasizes the fact that miracles are the basis of faith. They're not. They are signs that are saying something that we're to believe in. And as we look at it, you think, it's interesting, and forgive me for, for saying it this way, but you note the divine incompleteness of Scripture. If what could be written could fill the world, if many other things the disciples saw in their presence, then notice the incompleteness. And there, it's divine. There is a divine incompleteness in all of this in Scripture. <clears throat> you know, when we read John, there's no nativity in his gospel. There's nothing about Jesus' baptism. There's nothing about Jesus praying all night and selecting the twelve. There are no parables. There's nothing of the Lord's Supper. In fact, one half of John's gospel happens in the last week of Jesus' life. There's a brevity to it that's remarkable. And you think, this is the greatest event in the history of the world that we're looking at here. It, it is the only, in comparison to all other things, significant thing that's taken place in regards to human history and time and eternity and then you think of the brevity of it, though. Why, why so little, as it were, maybe in our minds, compared to the other world's, you know, writings? You read the, the you know, biography of Napoleon is this thick, or even Adolf Hitler, tyrants and world leaders, you know, the things, the Iliad, the things that, you know, Aristotle wrote. You think of the volumes and volumes and volumes if you take Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John in your Bible, you know, it's about an eighth inch thick. You think, this is the record of the most significant thing that's happened in the history of humanity. And there's a divine brevity to it. Remarkable. There's a divine, as it were, incompleteness to this. Because, you know, Jesus said, unless your faith becomes like that of a child, you'll in no wise enter in. What he wants to get across to us is so trimmed down and it is so pointed. It, it is so sharp, you know, it, it is so true that all of those other things fall away so he can communicate this one truth about his son. And John says, you know, blessed are those that have not seen yet believe. That's all of us here. And he said, there's all kinds of things I could have written that he did. But the signs, these are specific signs that are written. These things are written. And he takes the time to give us purpose. As we look through this, he said, there's a lot other things that are not written in this book, Biblia, in this book, it seems he's taken for granted that his readers, 90 AD, are familiar with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But there are many other signs as Jesus did in the presence. John saw them of his disciples, which are not written in this book. You think as 90 years old, he's putting his quill to the page and he's thinking about all of the other things that the Holy Spirit is leading him very specifically to hit per certain things and put them in front of us. 
And then he says, here's the purpose. This is the purpose of John's writing. He says, these things are written. And in verse 30 and 31, written, is, it's, per, it's a, a perfect tense in each place. It says, it says, many other things he did in the presence of his disciples, which are not written and stand unwritten today. But these things are written and stand written today in our presence. He says that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may be having life in his name. So he gives us the purpose here, why this is written. And he says it's not academic. It's not intellectual, though it never sacrifices intellect or blackmails it. The purpose of this is, number one, that you might literally be believing, <clears throat> and number two, that you may be having life. What is true belief? What is real life? That's the question we come to in verse 31. And look, for those of you that are eggheads, um, you know, there's a great, there's a controversy here. Uh, is this, and, and if you're You'll know there's two people here that'll know what I'm talking about. I feel bad for you if you've delved into this. Uh, the the eridus subjunctive, or is it present subjunctive? You know, that you might be believing, if it's eridus subjunctives, that you might come to believe, which means it was written to unbelievers. If it's present subjunctive, that you might be believing, that means it's written to believers to strengthen their faith. So then they want to sacrifice everything in here and get on the battlefield and joust over whether this is written to unbelievers or is it written to believers. We've been studying it for a year. Was it written to you? Two of you? Well, we tried, didn't we? <laughs> You know, in the Bible, faith is never static. Faith never stands still. Faith is something we come to, and then faith is something that progresses, and it grows, and, and we're perfected in. So obviously, through the centuries, what a ridiculous argument that is, because even as we've studied here in the last year or so, many people have come forward and accepted Christ, listening to John's gospel. And yet for you and I that believe, our faith has been strengthened as we've gone through it. So even, you know, you go to the, the manuscripts and all that, they're evenly divided. It's wonderful. It's not one or the other. It's both, obviously. And I think that's so important. But for you and I, if you're witnessing to your friends, your relatives, get him in John. John says this is specifically written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and that you may have life through his name. Get them to John's gospel. It's a great place for them to start. And then for you and I, it's been sweeter to me than it ever has before, just going through it this time, sitting alone with it. How remarkable. But it raises the question for those who may be questioning, what is true belief and what is real life? And look, there's confusion in the church about that. And there's certainly confusion in the world about that. And we hear people say things like, well, all that matters is that you have faith. What does that mean? Keep the faith, bro. <laughs> have faith. Well, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. This belief, and as we go into the New Testament, you have the word belief, believe, you know, about 240 times. And you have the word faith used about 240 times. This is no small subject. This is nothing to be pushed to the side. It's not, no, you know, there's nowhere in the Bible that says as long as you have faith. What does that mean? If you would take what the Bible does say and say to all those people who say, well, hey, you know, all that matters is you have faith. If you would add the name Jesus Christ to that as a mandate, you would lose most of them very quickly. Right. And you have in the church today, sadly, 
in much of denominational America, you know, you, you have Luther would turn over in his grave if he could see the Lutheran church today. You know, the, the Wesleys would roll over if they saw the Methodist church today. You know, you, you, you Calvin, if he saw what some of the Presbyterian church is doing, you know, you think the founders, because it gets generations away, and then there's just this confusion. What is the belief? What is belief? What, you have faith. And then you have, you know, the, the other side of the church that's media driven, it's, you know, celebrity driven, and, and they just want to draw crowds. So they're saying, hey, you know, have faith. You'll prosper. Have faith. God's got better things for you. Have faith. You'll live up to your potential. Have faith. You might as well have Tony Robbins in the pulpit, you know. The, 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 and they're pushing that. That's nothing to do with it. That's not faith. And the world says, well, if you believe in this, you're better off. If you believe in that, you're better off. I can see the world's better off by all the stuff it believes in. But the world says, if you don't believe what I believe, I'm going to kill you. If you don't believe what I believe, I'm going to kill you. That's not faith. Just have faith, bro. John boils it down. You, you, you have to understand. He says he did these in the presence of his disciples. I'm one of them. I walked with him. I leaned on his breast. I heard him cry, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. I remember when he called me from the nets to drop my nets and to follow him. And it isn't just have faith. It isn't saying that true faith is just saying, I believe in God. The Bible doesn't teach that. Caiaphas believed in God. Annas believed in God. The Pharisees and Sadducees believed in God. James says this, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe, and they tremble. So because you say there's one God, I got faith, there's one God, it doesn't mean anything. It means you're going to go to a Christless eternity and perish there unless you understand what to believe, and it's your reality and your personal faith, you know. And look, Satan, he's not an agnostic. He's not an atheist. He knows there's one God and believes. He believes that Christ accomplished, you know, the, the work of atonement on the cross for lost human beings. He believes that. Understand behind all of this. And Satan and his hordes tremble, James says, because they have made their choice. It will never change. And they are as far from redemption as the east is from the west. The distance is immeasurable. And they hate the Jewish people. They hate the plan of God. They hate Jerusalem. They hate Christians. They hate the cross of Christ. As you see the insanity in the world today, understand there is a darkness behind it because Satan knows when this all falls away, when Biden and Trump fall away, when you close your eyes in death, when the eagles in San Francisco fall away and is gone, you know, Republican and Democrat, Ukrainian, you know, Palestinian, Israeli. It's all going to fall away. All of it's going to fall away. And all that's going to be left is, did you believe that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God? Because in that you have life. That's all that's going to matter. In that you have life. And, and we get tangled up in all of this other stuff. We should be good citizens. You know, we, we should excel. We want to do things. We want to be good at what we will get a P, PhD. I admire you. That's a, an undertaking. You run your own business. You raise kids in the, in the Lord to write. It's all admirable. But in the final analysis here, all bragging rights are going to disappear. I did this, I did that, I accomplished this, I accomplished that. Ain't none of it. You know, the, the simplicity of this, you know, 
Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that go there. At, turn the news on when you get out. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. Few there be that find it. And in that place, nobody's bragging. Well, I did this. I accomplished this. I did that. I put the stained glass windows in the church. I built an orphanage. I did this. I'm not like that sap over there. I'm not like those guys over there. I'm not like those, you know, charismaniacs over here. I'm not. No. If you come to Christ personally, individually, all other bragging rights fall away. Don't walk in here, you know, pompous, like I'm this, I'm that, I'm Pastor Joe. So what? I'm, you know, I'm going to get to heaven and say, I'm Pastor Joe. He's going to say, never heard of you. <laughs> I'm going to get to heaven and say, Father, I'm here because the blood of Christ has paid the way for me to be forgiven. And he's going to say, enter in. Enter in, thou faithful servant. And he's putting this in front of us here in a remarkable, remarkable way, I believe. And it pulls us to that personal place. And he says that you might be believing, there's a process here, that Christ, Jesus is the Messiah. Christ is the anointed one, the one who fulfilled all that the prophets have spoken of that he's come in human flesh. His first chapter told us that, that he dwelt in flesh. He came and he walked among us. We beheld his glory. You know, it, 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 in the beginning was the word. The word was, was with God. The word was God. Nothing was made except that was made by him. In him was life and the life was the light of men. He tells us and he said, he came unto his own. His own, they, they received him not. He came into the world, made the world. The world knew him not, but to as many as receive him. That's the theme of the book. To them, he's given the authority. On the authority of believing in his name. To as many as receive him, to them he gives the authority to be called the children of God. How remarkable. And it's that personal relationship with Jesus. If you're here today and you've never come to Christ, it's not about Calvary Chapel. It's not about the Catholic Church. It's not about politics. It's not about Democrat or Republican. It's not about justice in the Middle East. It's not about what's happening in Ukraine. It's not about red communist China and them moving forward as a hegemony in that part of the world. It's not about any of that. It's not about any of that. That's all going to fade away to dust. All of it. And eternity will be the reality. And life then will be the life that those who have trusted Christ to be Messiah and Son of God. That he is completely human and completely divine. And when John wrote 98D, the two main heresies were saying, well, yeah, Christ came in flesh, but he wasn't God. Or Christ was God, but he didn't really come in flesh. John said, no, no. The message I'm giving you is Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the one who's come fully in the flesh. The son of God, the one who is fully God. Thomas, right before this, said, my Lord and my God. Peter, when Jesus asked him, who do men say that I am? He says, some say Moses, some, I mean, some say Elijah, some Jeremiah. What do you say? Well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And he says, blessed art thou, Simon of Arjuna. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Okay? What is saying to us here, IQ is not going to help. IQ is a wonderful thing. Whatever it is, I forget what it means, but whatever it is, I know it's wonderful. <laughs> Wish I had a little, I think. Flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father who's in heaven. There's a reality there. It's in relationship. One of the Puritan writers I read said, it's, it's like Elijah and the widow of Zarephath and her son died. And Elijah laid on him. He said, like Christ, laid on him 
face to face, beating heart to dead heart, living lungs breathing into him the breath of life into dead lungs. And he gave life to what was dead. And he said, that's what Jesus has done. He's laid himself upon us. The Messiah, the Son of God. And by believing, we received life. Do you know him? The demons. In Ephesus said to the seven sons of Sceva, hey, Jesus we know. They knew. Paul we know. You guys, we don't know who you are. And they were in trouble. When Jesus was baptized, a voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son, the son of God, in whom I am well pleased. Satan, in Matthew 4, when he comes to tempt him in the wilderness, where he says, if you're the son of God, class condition in the Greek there, since you're the son of God. He had no doubt. Turn these stones into bread. He's the Messiah, fully human, our great high priest, touched with our infirmities, every way tempted as we are yet without sin. And he is fully God, deity. And that divinity put on human skin to walk with us, to pay for our sins, because he wants a relationship with us. And you bring nothing to the table. No bragging rights. All you can do is come and believe in his name. In him. That he alone. In time and eternity. Is the reason. Why you have eternal life. You know, there are no doubt remarkable world estimation scholars that have studied the Bible historically for universities their whole life. There are archaeologists who have broken down the history of the Bible and dug in it with their whole life that are going to perish without Christ. But there's a grandma sitting somewhere in the corner through God's grace who got a hold of it. And who loves Jesus. There's a kid in first grade. Who sings Jesus loves me this I know. For the Bible tells me so. And means it more than the scholar. There's the person who thinks. He walks with me. And he does. And he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks. And the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gives to me within my heart it's ringing. You think of who he is. You think of what he's done. It is all in him. The last two words here in verse 31, his name. It is all there. It is in Jesus Christ himself. That is true faith. It's not have the faith, brother. Oh, that person has faith. No, no, no. Faith is, is not just an exercise in frustration. It, it's an ob, objectively, it is attached to a particular person with a particular name. And his name is Jesus. What he's fulfilled is Messiahship. He's the Messiah. And he's done that because he's deity. He's the son of God. And he stepped into our world. And it's so simple. Why is it condensed down? Why, why this divine incompleteness? Why this broadest subject in the history of humanity, you know, down Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John to an eighth of an inch when all of these massive volumes are everywhere else and everything else? Because, because he wants it that simple. That's what we need. 
You know, David would say, oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all of the earth. When I consider the heavens, he said, the work of thy fingers. He's looking at the, the broadness of it all. And he says, yet out of the mouths of babes, thou hast perfected praise. That a first grader can sing that. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, and mean it. And, and David says, when I consider the sun and the moon and the stars, the work of thy fingers, what is man? Man wants to start at the top. We're, man's at the top and the monkeys are under us. That's where we've come from. Pond scum to salamanders to monkeys to humans. What a family tree. That psalm says we're a little lower than the angels, not a little higher than the monkeys. You can choose your place. It's up to you. We live in a world that's acting just a little higher than the monkeys. When I consider the sun and the moon and the stars, the work of thy fingers, then you ask the question. Then the question comes, what is man? Not before that. Then you ask the question, what is man? When I consider the sun the moon and the stars, the work of thy fingers. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? John, the disciple who he tells us whom the Lord loved, says many other signs truly Jesus did in our very presence, we were eyewitnesses. And they're not written in this book. I suppose the world itself couldn't contain the things that would be written. But this divine incompleteness, this brevity hits the target. But these are written that ye, that's me and you, might be believing that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that believing you might be having life, eternal life, no doubt, in his name, that you might be having. So, look, eternal life is not something that you and I receive as a reward when we get to heaven. Eternal life is something that we receive when we believe in Christ as our savior. That's what true belief is, and that's what real life is. It's life that transcends this world, but we have it now, dwelling in us. It's changed us. We're different than we were. We're, we're not what we need to be, but we ain't what we used to be. Charles Spurgeon said, I'm not what I should be, but I'm not what I used to be, and I'm not what I'm going to be. Bumper sticker, be good, right? <laughs> the better bumper sticker would be this, no Christ, K-N-O-W. You know what that means, right? Yeah. Good. <laughs> no Christ, no life. K-N-O-W. And then right under it, you put no Christ, N-O, no Christ, no life. So to no Christ, no Christ, no life. No Christ, no life. Make the bumper sticker, please. <laughs> but when you think of all this, look, think of what it is that we have to proclaim. Should you and I, should we ever be ashamed of the message that we have. You know, the world's antagonistic towards us because there's darkness behind it. There's a, there's a devil who believes it's all true and hates it. And, he, and the violence and the insanity we see going on in the world today, even in the Middle East, there are dark forces behind that because this is all gonna fade away. He's gonna be lost forever. He's gonna be cast into outer darkness. And you and I are gonna be with the Lord in heaven forever and forever and forever. And the reason we're getting there it's not because we performed anything. 
It's simple faith because we believed. And so many people have a hard time accepting that because they have to set aside all of their bragging rights. They got nothing. You come to this equation, you make no contribution. You show up with nothing, but Lord, I believe that a sinner like me, worthless in and of themselves, can have real life. John said, you know, that's why I wrote. Could have wrote a lot of other things. But the things I did write, the Holy Spirit moved on my heart as an old, old man. Is so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah. And that believing, you would have life through his name. Amen. Let's stand. Let's pray together. And again, I would say if you're here today and you've never come to Christ, please come up and talk with us after the service. Don't trust Calvary Chapel. Don't trust the Catholic Church. Don't trust the priest. Don't trust me. Don't trust. Trust Jesus, we're telling you today. And it's so simple that a child could step into it. So we encourage you to come afterwards. If you're not sure where you're going to spend eternity, you need to be sure. And you can be sure before you walk out of this building. Come up. We'd love to pray with you and give you a Bible to read. But Lord Jesus, you overheard. We settle our hearts before you. We thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you. Here we are 2,000 years later. And these things that have been put to the page are still speaking in their brevity and in their simplicity, Lord. When volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of other things have surrounded mankind. The beauty, Lord. The ability of your simple word to pierce a human heart. We're so thankful. And Lord, we all think of friends and relatives that don't know you or coming into that season of the nativity. Lord, let us without apology have boldness, Lord, to share the simple, 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 simple truth, Lord, without complication. We need your grace to do that, Lord. We get our fingerprints on everything. Help us, Lord Jesus. We believe when we ask this, we're asking according to your will, and we pray in your name and for your glory. Amen.